over 40 faculty um, uh, from across the region um, learning the basics of public and ultrasound this afternoon. And so that was an incredible experience, uh, but it has resulted in a little bit of vocal issues. So if you're having a hard time hearing me, just raise your hand and let me know. So my name is Brenna Ramos. I'm a family physician from California, and I started the Global Ultrasound Institute um, as an organization to really build capacity around pointy care ultrasound. So I'm just going to tell you a little story about pointy care ultrasound and why and how I found myself in this in this in this place. Um, and the story begins across the world um, in my parents' home country of the Philippines. And so we're going to zoom in. Um, on one particular island called Late Day in a city called Maasin. And in that city um, lived a man named Francisco. And he had permission from his family to tell the story. So Francisco was, was 45 um, and he was living in a village around the outskirts of Maasin. This village is called Lormoy, population 300, um, and this is the center of town. And his family really didn't have any, um, had, didn't have the resources to take him to um, the, the, the town down the mountain um, when he started developing belly pain. So he was 45, he started having some belly pain, and um, he just progressively got sicker and sicker. Um, but his family at the time couldn't afford to take him to the doctor. Um, and so he um, just, just kind of progressively got worse and worse. And fast forward many, many years later, um, I think about what could have been done for Francisco. Um, these are just different ultrasound images of various diagnoses in, in, in the valley that could have been done within a few minutes um, in the hands of a, 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 a trained provider. So this is an example of an appendicitis. This is an example of um, gallstones and signs of acute cholecystitis. This is a sign, this is a, a triple A um, um, with a thrombus. Um, uh, this is an example of um, um, some free fluid in the abdomen that may be a sign of um, a, a rupture of viscous or ascites from, from malignancy or something else. Um, um, so this is a, another example of um, a sign of obstruction of the kidney. Um, there's an example of uh, diverticulitis. Um, and the reason why I'm showing you these different ultrasound images is because these are um, just different um, modalities that can be used to um, uh, narrow down a differential diagnosis. So for this particular um, for, for Francisco, um, his, unfortunately, because his family didn't have the resources to take him to um, another health facility, and even if they had the resources, it's questionable if that health facility would have had um, the diagnostic capability to take care of him. Um, and he passed away several weeks later. Um, and still not really not sure why. Um, Francisco left six children behind. Um, his, um, his oldest child was um, Bonifacio, and um, Bonifacio is my dad, and so that's me um, with a, a lot of attitude as a, as a little kid. And so this story about uh, my grandfather um, and the very lack of access to basic care um, in the rural part of the Philippines many years ago has really stayed with me. It's part of my imprint, my fabric as um, as a as a human being, and one of the many reasons why I decided to become a family physician. And his story is not is unfortunately not unique. Um, it's not a, a story that's unique to the Philippine landscape. This is something that still happens um, every single day, even in our own backyard. Um, and taking a, taking a step back um, on a more global scale. Half the world still has little to no access to diagnostic, basic diagnostic imaging. And we think about um, primary care and, and outpatient clinic, um, uh, rural areas, that number is even, even less than that. So very limited access to ancillary studies, labs, and imaging in most parts of the world. And these diagnostic deserts, not deserts, deserts, <laughs> 
are are one of the many challenges our health systems face. And so with that background, I want to tell you a story about home care ultrasound, what it is, why it's a thing, <coughs> and what it has to do with family medicine. Um, so fast forward, um, when I was a resident at Contra Costa, I had a patient um, who was a 45-year-old who had a cough and very shortness of breath. And um, in the emergency room, he was diagnosed with um, a pneumonia, the start of the fluids and the antibiotics, and admitted to, um, in, uh, to a medicine floor. And as a, as a, as a resident, I was um, lucky enough to have a mentor, uh, several mentors who were skilled in ultrasound and, and taught um, point of ultrasound. And so on my point of care ultrasound rotation, um, I uh, did an ultrasound in this patient, and this is what I saw, um, which is um, a, a large pericardial effusion around the heart. This patient ended up having cardiac tamponade um, and it had a pericardiocentesis, and he did, he survived and did well. Um, but this, I think, um, my, my imprint as, as a young person and then my and other imprints throughout my journey in medicine and as a resident, um, it really shapes um, my journey through with ultrasound and the creation of Global Ultrasound Institute. Um, if we take a step back and look at the arc of medicine and where we are today, um, technology is just rapidly advancing, um, and the landscape of diagnostic imaging has rapidly advanced in the last few decades. There are machines that were the size of large car-based machines that you had a hard time kind of fitting through a doorway to the handheld devices. And so these devices are just so much more ubiquitous. Um, and more so in medical education, we're seeing more and more medical schools that are incorporating point of ultrasound in, in um, anatomy, and physiology, pathology. And so these students, these med students are starting residency programs thinking about how ultrasound can give them more information as an extension of the physical exam. Um, and so how do we bridge these two worlds together where, our, um, where if you weren't in, if you finished residency um, more than a few years ago, you never got this, this training and how do you bridge that gap from um, uh, sharing your clinical knowledge and experience with um, a new resident and bridging that gap with their experience um, in point of care ultrasound. And so this, um, what's really been incredible is how clinical ultrasound has evolved um, across multiple medical specialties, um, cardiology, emergency medicine, and critical care. Um, most medical societies have put out position papers in support of the use of clinical ultrasound, and most recently, the American Academy of Family Physicians, and I think, um, as most of you are um, familiar with, has now become uh, an ACGME requirements um, of a focus experience in residency. So this has been um, kind of a changing landscape of focus in family medicine and its adoption. And what we're seeing now, um, just even in the last decade, is um, and, uh, so many more programs establishing their ultrasound um, training uh, curricula, and, um, and this is really from this, after, from this morning, seeing dozens of um, faculty and leaders of family medicine acquiring the skill and um, trying to kind of piece together this puzzle of how to integrate a robust, um, focused experience and training program within their residencies. We're really seeing this come to life um, in, in family medicine. So I'll fast forward to Global Ultrasound Institute and tell you a little bit about that story. Um, one of my mentors in residency, Dr. Kevin Bergman, um, uh, and I took a walk a few years after I finished residency. We were colleagues working in a safety net emergency, uh, emergency room just outside of um, San Francisco. And we were talking about um, how, to, how challenging it is for so many learners to acquire these skills if they're not already in a program or don't already have a mentor that has strong focus skills that can teach them. Um, and so that's how Global Ultrasound Institute is born. It's really trying to um, decrease the friction to adoption and support uh, learners
doctors all around the world. So Kevin Mervin and I are both family medicine doctors um, uh, by training. And over the last five years since we started this organization, this what was a, a passion project um, has grown tremendously to over 2,200 um, providers now, um, trained learners in over 40 countries, um, um, and over 10,000 um, medical professionals around the world. Um, and that was something that took a lot of passion, hard work, um, and connection, finding the connections across um, multiple specialties, um, uh, connections vertically with, within the educational system, medical school, residency, and beyond fellowships, um, and really forming partnerships. And these are just some of the institutions that now uh, use um, uh, the platform that we built. Um, and so we quickly realized that doing courses um, and traveling around the world and doing courses around the world is very important, having a hands on learning experience, it just wasn't enough to get a learner and an institution to point B, that being real adoption, that being a certain degree of competency and confidence to use this in clinical practice, and that included credentialing, and developing credentialing pathways. Um, and so uh, building kind of the infrastructure um, required an in-person approach, it required a virtual approach, it required building software and technology that would allow for longitudinal quality assurance and doing that securely and have a compliance. Um, and more recently, uh, using uh, even more advanced learning tools and machine learning to expand access um, to expertise all around the world. So I want to share a little bit about some of the work that we have done globally. These are just um, uh, some of the some of some of the countries where um, uh, we've been training and where learners are using our platform. And I want to highlight two particular countries: Ukraine and Kenya, um, um, as uh, having worked very closely with um, with providers there. So um, uh, now over a year ago, um, a group of um, Focus experts um, and primary care providers in Ukraine uh, reached out to Kevin and I because um, they were familiar with Focus, uh, Focus for Primary Care, um, the book that was written, and uh, reached out to the editor um, and put us all in contact. Um, and what that resulted in was a partnership um, because they wanted support with learning materials to, to, to um, Develop their their point of care ultrasound programs as they were teaching them in Ukraine, um, and so we worked together to translate um, the the bulk of the learning platform into Ukrainian, which is which is what we did, and, and made it widely available uh, for free to um, providers in Ukraine. And and over the last year, that's resulted in over three thousand learners using the platform, and this is. Um, this is just a, a, a video um, that was released by one of the um, handheld device companies uh, showing the usage and adoption of um, point of care ultrasound now and teaching. Um, so it's just really exciting and to see um, providers on the front line um, using um, point of care ultrasound in a very, very concrete way on a daily basis to provide um, the better care for their patients. Um, and just so everyone knows, we are completely device agnostic. I have no um, disclosures with respect to device companies. Um, so that was a, you know, very in, in brief um, the, the, the work we, we did with um, a, a team of champions um, and focus providers, um, uh, Dr. Spons, that is on <coughs> Dr. Dean Boos and I want to um, move to, to Kenya and, and highlight another another uh, partnership, um, and this was with um, uh, the, the Gates Foundation and um, Kenyatta University and Butterfly um, to train um, over 500 uh, nurse midwives coming from rural parts of primarily rural parts of Kenya, and the project um, was. The, the, the catalyst behind the project was around maternal, um, maternal, um, maternal health outcomes and identifying regions in Kenya with the highest maternal mortality rates and, um, and uh, training nurse midwives from these particular regions in basic 
with obstetric follicular ultrasound uh, could help um, uh, triage, uh, help them triage patients to a higher level of care if needed. Um, and so over the course of 10 weeks, um, over 500 clinicians were, were trained and given uh, the ultrasound and, um, and the tablet device. And, and then we tracked over time their, their usage with, with the road and how, what kinds of diagnoses they were making and how useful the, um, the training was. And, it, um, and, and over, over the course of a year, um, over the course of 11 months, excuse me, almost 100,000 scans were done. And so factoring in the cost of, um, the cost of implementation and devices, um, to the number of scans that were being done, um, it turned out to be close to six dollars a scan, which is, if you're thinking about impact and um, from an investment standpoint, it's, it's it's remarkable. And this is just in the first year. Um, the, the training and the skills don't just disappear, and the, the devices have a five-year lifespan. So over the course of the next few years, we're going to see this number go down even more. Um, and so what we're doing now is. Um, is working with ministries of health and um, trying to get focus um, on the agenda at the na national levels um, in um, gu guidelines and scopes of practice across multiple specialties for frontline providers and trying to um, advocate for building this into a um, into health budgets to make this much more sustainable. Um, and so over over the years. Um, Global Ultrasound Institute has grown. Um, we were a small team of family medicine doctors training and doing education, and now we've grown um, to a much larger team that includes um, uh, doctors who um, are also non-family medicine doctors. It's okay, we, we still love them. But um, our team, our core team is family medicine, which I just, I'm really very proud of, especially in this space. Um, um, at a global leadership scale where family medicine doesn't always get the respect that we deserve. So to step in a room and know that being a great generalist is what we need right now to connect the dots, to, to um, form alliances and bridges and um, de-silo um, so much of how resources get funneled and how resources don't get funneled, ultimately to, um, to make actual impact, um, not to fund something just because it's maybe interesting or will get published in science or nature, the world in general, but funding research, funding projects that have actual impact that can be measured. Um, and, and so we've um, started um, as an organization going to this uh, new phase of um, how can we bridge these technological solutions that are being rapidly developed in, in artificial intelligence and bring it back to earth, bring it back to the patient and the provider, um, and ultimately um, framing technological development within, with, this, with, with the intent in mind, the intent of um, increasing access and strengthening the trust between the patient and their providers. Um, and that is, it's, you know, I like to think that that is always part of the conversation when technology is developed, but unfortunately that isn't always central. And so as an organization, this is um, very much part of our core mission is to, you know, these, you know, these rockets are, 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 are are ready to kind of lift off, and we need to make sure that as family medicine docs, as advocates, that we are able to steer them and navigate um, these, um, these changing waters. Larry's coming up to me, so I'm having a feeling that means we're kind of out of time. So um, I just want to thank everybody. Um, I told the story, a very personal story, and it went very global, large scale, and family medicine. Um, and I just I wanted to just let you know that I'm so grateful one to, to be here. So thanks so much for the invitation. Um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, and 
I want to open the floor for any questions.